The Lady with the Dog Short Story The Lady with the Dog by Anton Chekhov is a touching short story of forbidden love and self-discovery set against societal norms, exploring the complexities of human emotions and relationships. Here is a retelling. People were talking about a new person spotted walking on the promenade, a woman with a dog. Dmitry Dmitrich Gurev had been in Yalta for two weeks and had gotten used to the place. He also started paying attention to new arrivals. Sitting outside at Vernet's cafe, he noticed a young woman wearing a toque walking by, she was blonde and not very tall, followed by a white Pomeranian. He saw her again in the municipal park and the town square, several times a day. She was always alone, wearing the same toque, with the Pomeranian following her. No one knew who she was, so they just called her the lady with the dog. Gira thought, if she's here without her husband and any friends, it might be a good idea to meet her. He was under 40, had a 12-year-old daughter, and two sons in school. He had been persuaded to marry during his second year of college, and now his wife looked almost twice his age. She was tall, with dark eyebrows, dignified, and considered herself intellectual. She liked to read, didn't use the hard sign at the end of words in her letters, and called him Dimitri instead of Dimitri. Although he secretly thought she was superficial, narrow-minded, and unfashionable, he was intimidated by her and didn't like being at home. He had been unfaithful to her for a long time, which is probably why he didn't think highly of women, calling them the lesser race. He was under 40, had a 12-year-old daughter, and two sons in school. He had been persuaded to marry during his second year of college, and now his wife looked almost twice his age. She was tall, with dark eyebrows, dignified, and considered herself intellectual. She liked to read, didn't use the hard sign at the end of words in her letters, and called him Dimitri instead of Dimitri. Although he secretly thought she was superficial, narrow-minded, and unfashionable, he was intimidated by her and didn't like being at home. He had been unfaithful to her for a long time, which is probably why he didn't think highly of women, calling them the lesser race. He believed his tough experiences allowed him to call them what he wanted, but he couldn't have lived without women. He felt awkward and reserved around men, but comfortable and at ease with women, knowing exactly what to say and do. He even felt fine being silent around them. There was a certain charm about him that attracted women and won their affection. He knew this and was drawn to them by some mysterious force. Girov had learned the hard way that every new romantic adventure, which at first seemed exciting and simple, usually turned into a complicated mess, especially in Moscow where people are hesitant and slow to act. But whenever he met an attractive woman, he forgot all his past lessons, felt a zest for life, and everything seemed easy and fun again. One evening, while dining at the restaurant in the park, the lady with the toque walked in and sat nearby. Her look, walk, clothes, and hairstyle made it clear to him that she was upper class, married, and new and bored in Yalta. He ignored the rumors about loose morals in Yalta, knowing they were mostly made up by people who wished they could have such adventures themselves. But when she sat close to him, he remembered tales of quick flings and mountain excursions, and the idea of a fleeting affair with a woman whose name he didn't even know suddenly intrigued him. He tried to get the Pomeranian's attention by snapping his fingers and wagging his finger at it when it came over. The dog growled at him, and he did it again. The woman looked at him, then quickly looked away, blushing. He doesn't bite, she said, blushing. May I give him a bone? he asked. With her approval, he added in a friendly tone, How long have you been in Yalta? I've been here about five days. And I'm already in my second week. They didn't speak for a bit. The days fly by, but it's so dull here, she said, without looking at him. People always say they're bored here. You never hear complaints in remote places like Belayev or Zizdra, but come here, and it's all so dull so dusty. You'd think they were missing Granada. She laughed. Then, they continued eating quietly, like strangers. But after dinner, they left together, engaging in the light, playful conversation of those who feel free and easy, indifferent to where they go or what they discuss. They commented on the unusual light over the sea, the water was a soft, tender purple, 
with moonlight casting a golden path across it. They mentioned how warm it was after the hot day. Girov shared that he was from Moscow, worked in a bank though he was actually a philologist, had once trained to sing for a private opera, but gave it up, and that he owned two houses in Moscow. From her, he learned she had grown up in Petersburg, but had been living in S for two years since her marriage, planned to stay in Yalta for another month, and her husband, who needed a rest too, might join her. She couldn't clearly explain whether her husband was on the Gubernia Council or the Zemstvo board, which she found amusing. He also found out her name was Anna Sergeyevna. Back in his room, he thought about her, confident they would meet again the next day. It seemed unavoidable. As he prepared for bed, he reflected on how recently she must have been a schoolgirl, like his own daughter, shy and reserved in her laughter and conversation with a stranger, probably her first experience being alone where men could approach her, knowing they had a hidden agenda she could easily guess. He remembered her slender neck and her fine gray eyes. And yet, there's something sad about her, he thought as he drifted off to sleep, a week had gone by since they first met. It was a holiday, and while inside was stuffy, outside, the dust swirled in the air, and hats were flying off heads. The day was scorching, driving Gurev to keep visiting the café, to buy fruit drinks and ice creams for Anna Sergeyevna to help them cool down. In the evening, as the wind calmed, they walked to the pier, to watch the steamer come in. The place was crowded with people, some holding flowers, waiting for friends. Two things stood out the older women dressing too young for their age and an unusual number of generals milling about. Due to the rough sea, the steamer was late, arriving after sunset and taking a while to dock. Anna Sergeyevna looked through her binoculars at the steamer and its passengers, as if searching for someone she knew. Turning to Gurev, her eyes sparkled. She talked a lot, asked rapid questions, and then immediately forgot what she wanted to know. In the crowd, she even lost her binoculars. As the crowd thinned and features blurred in the dimming light, Anna Sergeyevna became quiet, occasionally smelling her flowers, but not looking at Girov. It's turning into a nice evening, he said. What do you want to do? We could take a drive. She didn't answer. He stared at her, then suddenly hugged her and kissed her. He was enveloped by the scent and moisture of the flowers. He quickly looked around, worried they had been seen. Let's go to your room, he whispered. And they hurried off. Her room was hot and smelled of a perfume she had bought from a Japanese store. Girov thought about the unpredictable encounters life brings. He remembered women who were cheerful and grateful for their fleeting moments of happiness with him. Then there were others, like his wife, who seemed insincere or overly dramatic during intimacy. There were also a few beautiful but cold women, whose beauty only repulsed him as their relationship cooled, but with Anna Sergeyevna, the awkwardness and timidity of inexperience were still there. She seemed to think of their affair as something very serious, as if she had done something terribly wrong, which he found strange and unsettling. It isn't right, she said. You'll never respect me again. A watermelon sat on the table. Girov cut a slice and ate it slowly. They sat in silence for a long while. Anna Sergeyevna seemed genuinely innocent and naive, a contrast to her heavy heart visible even in the dim candlelight. Why would I lose respect for you? Girov asked, you're being too hard on yourself. May God forgive me, she said, tears filling her eyes. It's horrible. You don't need to justify yourself. How can I? I feel like a terrible person and it's not my husband I've betrayed, but myself. I've been deceiving myself for a long time. My husband might be decent, but he's a nobody. I married him young, craving something more, a different kind of life. I was curious, you won't understand, but I couldn't hold back anymore, nothing could stop me. I told my husband I was sick and came here. And now, I've turned into someone I despise. Here I've listened, bored. Her naivety and guilt were so unexpected. If not for her tears, he might have thought she was joking. I don't understand, he said softly. What do you want? She pressed her face into his chest. Believe me, please believe me, she said. I love everything pure and honest. 
I've never liked vice. I don't know what came over me. People say they're tricked by the devil, and I feel the devil has tricked me too.